Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ModeCast podcast, a podcast powered by your smart mobility provider, ModeShift. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Max Mickey, and in this podcast, we talk about all things transit. Before we dive into today's episode, please subscribe and follow us on your preferred streaming platform. Now let's get started. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our inaugural episode of the ModeCast podcast. And in this podcast, we're going to sit down with Alan Hunter, um, who is the director of the Texas Transit Association, um, and talk about transit. Um, Alan, thanks so much for being out with us today. Oh, you bet. Appreciate you having us. Yeah, yeah. How's uh, how's everything over there in Texas? Um, you still dealing with um, heat waves and, and crazy weather? Yeah, I tell you, it's been a, it's been a crazy year between the Arctic blast, the heat, and, and and of course now we've been hit with a lot of rain. It's it's been unseasonably wet for a lot of the state of Texas. You know, it's a, it's a little different. We've had parts of the state that are flooding and. And, um, you know, much, much more. So we're, we're dealing with a lot more rain this year than we typically do. Typically, this is the time of year where everything turns brown and, <laughs> and it's 100 plus. But, uh, but I, I got to tell you, the, the, the heat's coming. It's just a little bit late getting here yeah, this year. Yeah, for, for our listeners, uh, where are you based at in Texas? Uh, I'm actually in Waco, Texas, which is kind of just uh, just south of Austin, but it's right about central Texas. So I'm right in the, right in the heart okay. of Texas. So you see and hear everything. You got... Uh, veins across the state. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, well, very cool. Um, well, again, for our, for our listeners and folks uh, dialing in here, um, if you don't mind, we'd love to hear a little bit about kind of your role with the GTA, um, you know, especially kind of how long you've been there. And even I think everyone's always usually curious kind of how you got into transit. Um, so if you don't mind kind of telling, telling our reader or listeners that, um, I'm sure they'd love to hear. Sure. Well, uh, like you said, my name is Alan Hunter. I'm the executive director here with the Texas Transit Association. Uh, we were founded in 1986. Uh, our members consist of everything from the large metropolitan, the small urban, the rural transit agencies, as well as private and public uh, entities all across the United States and, and as far north as Canada. Um, now, I've been the executive director. This is my second year. And, um, you know, it's uh, I, I'm not totally new to transit. Prior to taking this role, I came from Waco Transit System where I was the GM, and we were both a small urban system and a rural transit uh, district. Uh, so we ran McLennan County Rural Transit District, and I did the, uh, the the small urban here in Waco. So I, I was pretty familiar with transit for about 15 years before I got into this. But but like a lot of people, you know, transit wasn't my first <laughs> career. You know, I, I started off as a director of safety and construction. Uh, I actually worked on the transit facility in Waco, and uh, that's when I even realized Waco had a transit uh, system because, you know, like so many people, uh, you know, I, I didn't depend on the system, didn't rely on the system. And, and quite frankly, it wasn't a very robust system. And so um, it was really intended for transit dependent. And so um, until we worked on the facility, I didn't even know we had a transit facility. <laughs> and so after working on the facility and building it, uh, I had the opportunity to come work in transit. And it's like everything else, you know, once, once this transit stuff gets in your blood, uh, man, it's hard to get it out. So I, I've been involved in transit now for, well, I was with Waco for about 15 years and now two years with the uh, TTA. Yeah, I was going to say transit and uh, kind of working in this space, it kind of, you get some fish hooks in you um, and it's it, it's hard to get them off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, very nice. Well, what's, uh, so, so you, before you know, you've kind of been in, um, you know, this role at the TTA working with, with Waco, um, now that you see obviously a broad spectrum, of all the different agencies in the TTA, uh, I'd be curious too. Um, what are some of like the you know similarities that a small rural system sees compared to um, you know a large urban system? Even though obviously very different um, you know day to day demands, but are there any kind of similarities that you've seen kind of across that are usually sitting on the front burners of you know both of those types of agencies? You know, usually on something like that, you know, the, the smaller the system, you know, in, in, at least here in Texas, you know, our rural providers have got to cover such a, a larger area. And a lot of times they're having to do that with the same resources or, or, or fewer resources than some of the larger agencies. And so I, I, I got to tell you, you know, as large as Texas is, you know, some of our rural systems are covering multiple counties, several hundred you know, square miles. And they're doing that with limited resources, limited vehicles, and uh, and limited staff. And uh, and I tell you, they they do a tremendous job. So I, I think the biggest challenge, um, you know, is just when you look at gravity of scale. The larger the the, the, lar the larger the system, 
the the more resources they've got. The smaller the system, you know, the fewer the resources. But again, just because you're a small rule system doesn't mean that geographically you don't have a huge area to cover. Yeah, I feel like transit systems are you know, kind of akin to um, an offensive line in, in football where, you know, when they're doing their jobs and, and kicking butt, no one really seems to notice uh, all, all the hard work that goes into making those, <laughs> uh, pun intended here, but buses run on time. <laughs> Well, the one thing I could tell you, and this has been such a challenging year for all of us, not just here in Texas, but across the entire U.S. and well, and, and the world for that matter with the mm-hmm. pandemic. But but the one thing I've seen is that any time something significant happens in a community, whether it's the pandemic or the Arctic blast that we've had, any time some, something significant hits a community, public transportation is there. I don't care if it's the you know the large metros, the small urbans, or the rules. I mean, these uh, these agencies support their communities uh, in so many different ways, and I've just been so impressed with all the different ways that they've been called upon to to jump in there and support these communities. And and, and again, all of them have done that through this entire pandemic. Um, all of our agencies throughout the state of Texas have continued to provide that service uh, day in and day out, with limited resources and and limited staff in some in some cases. Yeah, I think. Uh... Uh, you know, Texas Strong or Texas Tough kind of took on some new meaning uh, last year um, with everything that was happening. Again, as you mentioned, between the the Art of Freeze and you know, obviously dealing with uh, COVID and the, and the pandemic. Um, but what what were these agencies doing to, to keep their heads kind of above water? Um, with uh, I feel like I feel like uh, especially Texas was kind of uh, just like a boxer in the corner of a ring, just just kind of getting getting hit on. <laughs> how did how did they keep standing up? Oh yeah. Well, you know, and again, we've got so much, you know, like, you know, we've got the hurricanes, we've got the, you know, of course, this year, we we had the Arctic blast, and of course, COVID, you know, a lot of what our agencies did this year was they had to get creative. And uh, when I talk about supporting the communities, um, they, when I said they got creative, they did, uh, some of them got creative in terms of creating new systems and new services. Uh, for example, um, a lot of schools were working, you know, were, were doing school, uh, school at home. So, so kids, had to have Wi-Fi hotspots. So a lot of our agencies would actually create Wi-Fi hotspots in neighborhoods by, since they had extra vehicles, since they were running reduced service, they would park buses in certain lower income neighborhoods to provide these Wi-Fi hotspots so students could uh, you know, get their lessons done. You know, there were shopper services created, trips to vaccine centers, uh, back when the Arctic blast hit, you know, a lot of agencies were taking people to and from shelters when the roads were nearly impassable. And so, um, so again, our, our agencies have just been. When you talk about resiliency and 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 just some of the creative things that our agencies have done, uh, this has certainly been a testimony. You know, th- this year has been a testimony to how creative some of our our agencies can can get. Yeah, wow. So some of the some of the agencies were kind of parking their buses in just certain spots, so kids could use the Wi-Fi to mm-hmm. to log on and you know do their work. How did how did that work? Uh, was it just hey, we're going to be parked in this lot, or um, how, how did they kind of coordinate? Um, to let folks know, because that, that's a pretty cool initiative to, to think outside the box. Well, you know, of course, yeah, of course, they work with the media. They let people know. They they they, they promote that and get the word out. And and then, um, you know, again, with the schools, you know, the schools kind of help promote those services, too, in different communities. But, uh, but yeah, those were very popular services. And, uh, and again, this is certainly to say this has been an interesting year is an understatement. But but uh, but, yeah, so many of our students have been, you know, like many across the country have been you know, doing their classes at home with uh, the Zoom and the the, the different virtual mm-hmm. meetings, you know, campaigns. So, so the the Wi-Fi has been has become very very important this year. Oh yeah, more so than in years. Yeah, past. it's uh, um, pretty crazy. Even if you think about you know ten years ago to today, and the ability to even do things like this, um, you know, have a have a video conversation and um, you know share it with you know our our industry. Um, it's it's pretty cool. Um, seeing kind of how much tech has come into the fold um, to to be helpful, um, but you know on that uh, on that note, what kind of uh, tech is um, Texas been looking at lately um, this year? What what are agencies talking about? You know, I'd say anything that makes their systems more mm-hmm. efficient. You know, um, any you know as far as new tech and things like that, the the big things that I'm seeing are 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 things that will minimize or eliminate any kind of passenger contact with the operators, things like automatic fare collection systems, mobile uh, fare ticketing systems. 
um, th- those have been the hot items. And now, of course, all your bigger systems have already had systems mm-hmm. like that. Uh, but some of our small urbans and rules, you know, this is new technology for a lot of them. So the challenge is, you know, finding systems like that that they can incorporate with uh, their current system, but at the same time not, you know, create any barriers for any passengers. And we just assume that every passenger has a cell phone or has a credit card, and and that's not quite the case for, for all of our passengers, especially once you get into these rural areas. So, you know, a lot of our agencies are looking at these types of systems, but, uh, you know, the concern is, you know, we don't want to create any barriers for these these passengers that are going to be using the system. Oh, yeah, I think that's that's probably been uh, forefront of the conversations. You know, we at ModeShift have been having, um, obviously, a little, little shameless plug. You know, we work on the, you know, mobility <laughs> side and contactless payments, mobile ticketing. But we often are partnering with, you know, like these smaller urban areas, bringing in, you know, smart cards and cash options and, and things like that. Um, but it seems like those are the types of conversations that most agencies, you know, want to have right now is not just, okay, we don't want to just add an app, but we need to add, you know, some almost systematic processes and, and, and technology just to make things easier for, for the riders, but also the drivers, keep them safe, um, you know, more tools, you know, on the back end. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we've been seeing as well. Well, and then the other thing too is, Anytime you add a new system to the mix, is making sure that system talks to the other yeah. systems. You know, it's. Uh, I think that's one of the things that I found very frustrating back when I was managing the system is that you know you have a a system that does this or a system that does that, but then the two systems, you know, they're they're, they're just apples and oranges. They just don't talk to one another, and and so anytime you add another system to the mix, is just you know you're optim you're you're hopeful that uh, it doesn't create any problems and that they they'll, they'll They'll have some synergy where they can work together. Yeah, absolutely. What's uh um so on that? What is the number one, or it could be one A and one B, um things that you do not miss <laughs> about uh, running a day to day agency? Um, which might be fun for some listeners. Uh, we, we maybe it pokes some sore spots for others <laughs> that have to do that every day. Um, but uh, well, what's something that that you don't miss? Or it could just be something that you know, that you love about the new role or newer. Excuse me. Well, you know, the, the the thing is, it's it's kind of just because I'm not dealing with it on a day to day basis. I know my peers are, yeah. and uh, you know, what's what's the old Sam Misery loves company? <laughs> you know, when when I see somebody else, it, it, it's hard for me to sit back and relax when I know somebody else is struggling. And so, in, in my role as the executive director, my my goal is uh, is to support our agencies the best I can and understanding what some of their challenges are. Uh, that that's where whether it's if you've got staffing issues, well. Hey, I'm going to do what I can to help support you. If you've got RFPs and you're looking at trying to get good coverage for that, I'm going to try to support you. And so the big challenge for me is I try to be an extension or a resource available to our different uh, agencies, especially these smaller mm-hmm. agencies. And so, uh, you know, I, I try to be the resource that maybe I didn't have when I was out there. And so, you know, that's what I try to be. So, so yeah, I, I, I uh, yeah, there's obviously some. I think the biggest thing I miss is just being in, involved in that day-to-day operation. You know, I, I, I you know, like I, like I said, once you get into transit, you either love it or you <laughs> hate it. And if you love it, you'll be in it forever. And uh, if you if you hate it, it's a short career. But it's funny how many people I've spoken to, transit wasn't their first career, and once they've done it for a couple of years, it's all they want to do. And so, you know, if you enjoy supporting your community and and you enjoy working with people. I just can't think of a better career. So anytime I see a bus zip down the road, you know, I just uh, I, I kind of miss sometimes. I've got that that empty void where I was involved in the day to day stuff, and uh, yeah, I miss it. I miss it a little bit. Yeah, trans is definitely um, one of the very important kind of unsung heroes, you know, in, in the community um, that a lot of folks, you know, don't even seem to notice or understand the importance of of those buses. Well, I think around. if we do our job right. I think that was one of the things that used to frustrate some of my staff is they'd say, well, you know, you know, we do all these things, we don't ever get credit for it. And I said, well, you know, that, that means we're doing a good yeah. job. You know, you know, if, uh, we, when we make the headline because something didn't work right, that's when there's a problem. So if, if the buses show up every day like they're supposed to and we're taking people where, where they're supposed to be, when they're supposed to be there, uh, that's not news. That's just what we do. So it's when something doesn't work that it becomes news. Oh, yeah. So, and, I'm, and I'm sure everyone's quick to let you know. Um <laughs> When, oh, yeah. when something's well, not course. happening when they want it to. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, very nice. Well, how is how's ridership been bouncing back um, uh, this year in Texas? 
Well, you know, obviously ridership this year, like, you know, like with so many things, took a mm -hmm. huge hit with the social distancing on the bus. Uh, a lot of our agencies actually went to, to free fare just so that we could eliminate that, that interaction mm -hmm. between uh, the driver and the passenger. You know, a lot of agencies put together barriers. But the big thing in terms of ridership, a lot of agencies reduce service or they put together social distancing, which, you know, dramatically reduced the capacity of that vehicle. So gradually that capacity has been creeping back. But uh, obviously, we're still, you know, we're not where we were, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, and we still got a ways to go. But but ridership is creeping okay. back, and so you know, we still got a number of agencies that are still working from home. Um, a lot of our smaller agencies are back in the office, and uh, each month more and more are returning to work. Uh, some are working modified schedules where it's maybe one or two days in the in the office this week, and then a few days home. So, but I think ultimately here in the next few months, if the if the trends continue the way we hope, uh, I, I think here in the next few months, a, at least people will be working in the office like normal, hopefully. And, uh, you know, and again, hopefully ridership will continue to improve. Yeah, in Texas. And in some places, ridership, you know, we, we've got a few places in Texas where ridership has made a full okay. recovery. And then others, it's, um, it's just still kind of getting there. Yeah, in Texas. You know? So we still got a ways to go. Texas is quite a, you know, a tech hub, right? Um, there's a lot of different kind of mobility and tech centers. Um, in the state. And quite often, I think a lot of those come with, you know, you know, it might be tech jobs where, you know, folks aren't uh, back in the office five days a week or may never be um, and kind of adapting to new, yeah. more hybrid, you know, models and, and schedules. Um, but do you think that'll play a role in some of the, the ridership comeback? Or, you know, do you think people rely less on personal vehicles because they don't need them as frequently? Uh, I'm kind of curious on your thoughts on kind of some of the new um, trends in working and how that affect um, your ridership. I mean, I, I think in the in the bigger cities, I think obviously it's gonna it, it's certainly gonna be a big impact. In the smaller cities and more rural areas, I think it'll be less of mm -hmm. an impact. Um, but in terms of uh, transit, you know, I think initially when this thing first hit, a lot of people, you know, kind of said, "Oh, we're just you know, man, we can do this from home and we can do all." But I think more and more people are realizing that there is something to that personal interaction. And there is some value for having these folks come to work and, and actually report into a place. So I, I think at least in transit, um, there may be some positions that obviously will, will still be a work from home type of position, mm -hmm. but I think uh, a lot of our transit agencies will probably at some point return back to maybe a pre-pandemic like, you know, like life mm -hmm. song. Yeah, that makes sense. I know on our job board, I posted a number of, I, I posted a number of positions for like, you know, engineering firms and things like that, and they are working from home. You know, that's one of the the, the big pushes that they, they do work from home. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, in obviously this kind of split between more rural and urban and, you know, these differences between not just workforces, but, you know, how the agencies operate. Uh, I'm kind of curious, what do the, the conversations look like regarding, like, mobility as a service or integrating different um like modes of service in a bigger city, that's going to be, you know, ride shares and scooters and bikes and things like that um, in a more, or excuse me, in an urban setting, it'll be that in a more rural setting, it's probably going to be more demand response um, with fixed and, and maybe some other things getting folded into, the, into there. Um, but what do those conversations look like um, for you know the agencies that you work with? Uh, is that still kind of a big focus is getting these different pieces in place? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I think the largest systems obviously are doing a, uh, a really good job of integrating all of those different level services. You know, the bigger cities, of course, have been have, they've been doing that and been trying to do that for some time. Uh, again, it's a little more challenging when you look at these smaller systems, just because, you know, well, for example, uh, the smaller the city, the, the 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 Ubers and Lyfts of the world, just you know, they don't have the, you know, you, you don't have the, the sheer quantity of those vehicles in a small mm -hmm. rural setting that you do like the large, you know, the large city, and so. So I think, um, you know, like you said, the demand response is more of an issue. You know, it's it's more prevalent in those rural areas, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, well, what's uh, what's kind of on the docket for for TTA the rest of this year? Um, if you had, uh, obviously, you have a platform here um, for some folks out there that might be, you know, considering joining or learning about it. Um, what's what's uh, the rest of this year and going into next look like for uh, the TTA? Well, you know, the, the, the big thing is uh, we're working with SWATA to do, you know, we're, ho we're hosting a joint conference okay. this year. Uh, we're excited to get back to in-person meetings. So this is going to be uh, February 23rd through the 26th. 
and this isn't just a conference. This is going to be a conference and expo in our state rodeo. Oh, boy. And so we'll have a state rodeo. And, and so for the first time, uh, we're going to allow other participants from outside the state of Texas to, partic to, to participate in our state rodeo. So it's going to be a state rodeo for our Texas participants, but it's also going to be kind of a a larger rodeo since APTA is not having their big rodeo this year. Uh, we're going to allow other state agencies from across the U.S. to participate if they choose, and we've already been approached by a number of people. And the, the one thing that we've done a little bit differently, uh, historically the rodeo would take place before the conference, and now what we're doing is we're doing the conference on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and the rodeo will kind of overlap with the expo. So the expo is going to have a lot of uh, a lot of attendance and a lot of uh, a lot of exposure between rodeo participants and conference attendance. So that so that's the big thing on the forefront, uh, and we're really excited about it. We've gotten a lot. Of, it's going to be in Austin, Texas, so it's right here in our, okay. our state's capital. Uh, capital Metro is the host uh, host agency, and uh, we're really looking forward to a to a good show. So that, and then just in terms of membership, um, you know, like I said, one of the things um, for for me is uh, when we bring in a new member, you know, I, I'm not just an executive, an executive director that collects your dues, I work for you. So when we bring in a new member, whether that's a transit system or an associate member, uh, you know, the big goal for me is I, I work with you uh, to, to support you any way we can. Yeah, very nice. And I'd say uh, that's something that, you know, we can take to heart as new members and getting involved uh, this year. It's been, uh, it's been wonderful um, to kind of be welcomed in into the TTA and, and get involved. So we, we've been uh, excited to be here and excited about this, uh, you know, larger conference that we got we have coming up. Um, but, Alan, I'll let you get back to the rest of your day. Um, it, it's been uh, wonderful to chat. Appreciate you having on. Um, so for everyone out there, uh, we hope you enjoyed the episode today. Um, so, again, thanks so much for listening. Hope you're having uh, a great day. Hopefully you learned some cool things about the TTA. Um, Alan, again, thank you so much for the time. Thanks, everybody. All right. Hey, yep. thank you, Max. Bye. Take care. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe so you're notified when a new episode is posted. We would love if you rate and review this podcast and share it with colleagues and friends in the industry. Thanks so much for listening, and I hope you're leaving with some great takeaways. I am your host, Maxwell Mickey, and until next time.